We thank the Lord for that special music. They had been uh, practicing to minister to us every Sunday. Uh, we thank the Lord for the choirs that uh, He has given us, and indeed, what a privilege to worship the Lord with also the choir ministering to us. If you have your Bibles with you, let me invite you to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians, the fifth chapter, we will be reading starting in the 22nd verse up to the 25th verse of this book. Ephesians chapter 5, starting in the 22nd verse up to the 26th. Let us all stand, please. Ephesians chapter 5, starting in the 22nd verse. Reading all together, from 22nd to the 26th verse, begin. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege that you have given us today to come and silence ourselves before you, begging that your blessed Holy Spirit would be upon us in your still small voice to talk to us, to encourage us, to challenge us in your way. Thank you, Lord, that with the brethren that you have gathered together, you alone is worthy of our praise. Indeed, Lord, it is the prayer of our hearts that our meditation and our praises be acceptable before you. Be with your servant and be, Lord, with each one who are here at this moment. We commit, Lord, ourselves unto you. Even, Lord, as you are going to get through us, through your word. And may, Lord, that you will be exalted in our midst. You alone should be glorified, be worshipped and praised. Accept, Lord our offerings unto you. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. As I have promised during the Mother's Day that there will be a Sunday that we would also be dealing with our fathers. So the fathers, one father after the Mother's Day uh, uh, sermon came to me and said, Pastor, it's okay that that preaching was for our wives. We will wait for our Sunday. So this is your Sunday, and I want to look at into something that I believe the Lord is teaching us in relation to the spiritual and biblical leadership we find in the Bible. The passage that we read in the book of Ephesians is the passage that many of you would hear during a wedding ceremony. And yet, this is the foundation that I want to bring to you this morning, that if, if, if there would be any scriptural foundation, this is the scriptural foundation that we believe concerning the spiritual leadership of a Christian father in the home. I know through all the years, you would, you would hear different kinds of reasoning. Why a wife or why children could not follow the leadership of the father. Some may say, I have an unbelieving husband. Some may say, my husband could not even gather us in our family devotion. Me as the wife, I would be the one that would initiate. Children would say, our father still is living in sin. How he could lead us in the ways of the Lord. And yet, these would never be the things that I've mentioned to you would ever cut down the leadership, the authority of the Father. Because the Word of God would say that this is instituted by God Himself. And probably many of you, 
as a believing wife, as a Christian wife, or probably you as a Christian son or daughter, probably by giving the respect, by honoring them, this would be the only way they would understand the gospel. Thinking that we are right, thinking that we know better than our fathers, probably would push them straight to hell rather than giving them what they deserve, the instituted, the designed by God hierarchy in the home, the leadership of the father. You know, I am telling you this, it's because we may find anything and all the reasons in the world why we should not obey, why we should not honor the fathers. But here, we realize that this is a divinely instituted, as far as God is concerned, that this is how we're going to look at the home. Now, I know many of you, probably as a wife, or as some would say, a single mother, that you are both acting as a father and a mother, I mean a father and a mother to your children. It is our prayer that God would give you the special grace. Many of you, probably you are the aunt, you are the uncle, you are the lolo, you are the lula. You are the one acting as a mother and father to your nieces, to your nephew, to your grandchildren. May God give you the special grace that you are going to lead this next generation for God. And yet, as far as what God has instituted in this word, the father, the husband, should take the lead, especially and above all on spiritual things that we see in our relationship in the home and in the church. You know, I am saying that it's because if there would be ever Satan would like to destroy both the church and the families, he would start with the leader. I read that Martin Luther, it took him such a long time to call his heavenly father, our father. He could call him my almighty God. He could call him the God who is, so, who is omnipotent, who is omnipresent. But it took him so long to say, God our Father. As far as he's concerned, he had a very bad experience as far as his human father is concerned. That every time he would mention Father, he would be reminded of his bad experiences in his childhood. And yet, for the many names that God could take, that we could call him, yes, he wanted us to call him our Heavenly Father. So really, when we think of the Father, of the spiritual leader in the home, God instituted you to be God's representative in that home. So here we realize that in the book of Ephesians chapter uh, 5, on verses 22 to 26, these are the words and we as a church, even though many things have already changed, we still stand strong in the word of God. We still believe that the leader of the home is the father. We still believe that God instituted that it should be done this way. Now, I want to tell you, especially those of you fathers who really live long and have struggled and fought hard to really raise up a family, that probably because of the experiences that you went through, you want to share the leadership, the authority, probably with your wife and probably with the adult members of the family. But we are reminded that in the judgment day, God is going to judge you, make you responsible, accountable to this sacred task the Lord has given a family. In other words, in the judgment day, no husband, no father could say, oh, it's because my wife, she, she did not submit to me. That's why I relinquish my leadership. Nobody could tell God that. It's already in my word. It's either you obey me, it's either your family obeyed me, or you are at best still disobedient leaders, fathers. He instituted it that the leadership in the home would rest upon the shoulder 
of the Father. So that's why he's going to tell us how we're going to respond to their leadership. Here in these verses, we find that wives be subject. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother. We are instructed as children. We are instructed, for those of you wives, how we're going to treat that leadership. We're going to treat that leadership the way we're going to obey and follow God. And there is only one exception to that. We ought to obey God rather than men. That is only the exception. If your father would tell you not to pray, if your father would tell you not to read your Bible, that's a different story. But usually it's about ideas. I have better idea than my father. I know what, what's better, what's, what I think is right. Now the bottom line that we find in the Word of God is as children, we're going to honor we are going to obey our parents, our father. Now, I don't know if there are some of you here who still have unbelieving fathers. And I don't know if they are getting the respect from us Christians. And probably the very thing that would make them soften and make them listen to the Word of God is really the one that is hardening their hearts. It's because we think that we are Christians, we have all the right to disobey our unbelieving fathers. I don't think so. The very thing that we're going... Now, I'm going to put it down to our level. You would say, oh, my papa told me to buy some cigarettes. I'm a Christian. He's an unbeliever. Pastor, what would I do? Will I obey him because the Bible says obey? I need to see you crying before your father. I want to see you begging him to quit. Papa, I'm buying because the word of God told me to obey you. But you know I'm obeying this with a heavy heart. I know that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are fighting against God, Papa. Papa, don't do this. I don't know if there would be a father what, that would be so hard that he believes you are really after his care, after his body, after what is good for him, would ever say, oh, shut up. Just obey me if you are really a Christian. But many times, we think that it's because we are Christians, we have already the right to disobey our parents. But here, the Word of God would tell us, He instituted this hierarchy in the home. Now, before, when I was growing up, just like we say in Ilunggo, Ti paano mo siya tahaon, kay waay man siya gapataha? As if that the fathers, they, they have to be de deserving to be respected. Later on, I realized somebody taught me on this, that respect, it has to be given. I don't know if some of you had been abused while you were still a child. And yet, for all the wisdom and the plan and what God had set up in your life, later on would go back to your father and said, Papa, I could never understand. I could be a bitter person now. I could be a hard person now. I could be hating you. For what I went through under your leadership in the home. But today, I realize you are God's authority. You misused it. You abused it. But as a Christian, I could love you. I could pray for you. I want to respect you. Happy Father's Day, Papa. I don't know if that's what you need today to do today. Our respect would probably bring them closer to God. But this is how God had really instituted it, that this should be the leadership in the home. In other words, if fathers abuse their authority, if fathers relinquish their responsibility, one day they're going to face our Heavenly Father. That would be their time with God. But as far as you and I are concerned, we want that before God, we are obedient. We submitted ourselves to the leadership that God has placed in our homes. Now, I don't know some of your fathers like, ah, pastor, 
I know the kind of life that I'm living. I'm not even worth a very, even just an inch of respect from my family. I abandon them. I don't even care about my leadership, about caring for them. You are telling my wife and my kids to respect me and honor me? Sa ilonggo ang tawag sina, ginpabati-batian ko na sila. So that they would become unresponsible and godly fathers when they go home because they know that this is how God has set it up. Now, there are some few fathers that I want to mention. There are four that specifically the Word of God would tell us. And of course, what we could find in the Bible would instruct us. And probably some, we, could, we, could, we should not repeat what they did. But to some also, we could learn. And probably today, I'm talking not only to the human fathers, I mean physical, but also I am talking to those who have taken upon yourself as the spiritual father. Talking about the Apostle Paul, which many believe remained single for the rest of his life, and yet he would call Timothy as my own son in the faith. Or probably as Peter, who would call John Mark as my son. Now, probably many of you, not only because you have children, but also one way or the other, the Lord has given you your nephews, your nieces, people, younger generation. They look up to you. You are the spiritual guide. You act as, as the spiritual father or parents to these young people. Yes, I am talking to you. This, the word of God, is going to instruct us in the way of the Lord. And may indeed, as a family, church family, many of your people who have not experienced and who have not been blessed with a spiritual, physical father in our church, you would find that there would be men or probably even women, aunties, lulas, that would take upon themselves to be our spiritual guides that would lead us. In the way of the Lord. Now, the first father I want us to see is found in Genesis chapter 7. In Genesis chapter 7, this is the story of a man that for many, many, many years have preached about the coming judgment. They live long during this time of history. So many calculated that he preached this message of judgment for about a hundred years. And yet in chapter 7 verse 5, the word of God would tell us, And the Lord did according unto all that the Lord commanded him. And Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. And Noah went in and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him into the ark because of the water of the flood. Now the Old Testament in Hebrews chapter 11, look at verse 7, would lead us into how this New Testament writer would interpret what had transpired in the time of Noah. Look at chapter 11, verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his own, of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. He could never convince a relative. He could not convince a neighbor. He could not convince a friend. But thank God, he was able to convince his own family that the impending judgment is coming. Get into the ark. Get into the ark. You know why, the, why I believe this is so precious? As what we have mentioned here before, I will mention this again, that our young people is still our most challenging but also our most precious mission field. 
In other words, we will not pride ourselves that we have gone to China, to Vietnam, to Malaysia, to Indonesia. We still want to see that our happiness when we have conquered our young people. Because sometimes we think it is so easy to convince others about the gospel and yet we are losing our young people. What shall a profit a man? What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and lose his son or daughter? What shall it profit for Don Baptist Church to conquer the whole world and we're losing our young people? No wonder that this is very dear to my heart. This man is very dear to my heart because sometimes we preachers and preachers family and pastors, sometimes it seems that it is so easy to us to reach out to others. And we fail to take the challenge that our family, it takes God's special grace because it's, it would not only be words, but also our family is what seeing both our words and our actions. They would not believe if we are all words. And probably this is the reason many of our young people have already condemned us as hypocrites. They hear one thing and they see another thing. So this is really a challenge for each one of us, just like Noah. If we could not convince the whole world, it is our prayer that we are not going to let Satan even just have one of our young people to go with him. May God grant us the blessing that he has bestowed upon Noah. In 1 Samuel, we have another family here. In the second chapter, the Lord, when he called the Israelites to follow him, he had chosen a family that would serve him in the tabernacle, in the temple. And this is the family of Aaron. The Levites would serve the Lord. And during this time, the priest, his name is Eli. Anyway, to summarize what had happened, for some reason, which later on I would tell you, the Lord had seen it fit to cut the lineage of Eli, both him and his sons, that they could not continue to serve the Lord. And these books, the books of the first and the second Samuel, many believe that the man whose name is attributed to these two books, he wrote what happened to his predecessor, this priest, the high priest, Eli. What happened was, Samuel was the product of many would like to see as dysfunctional family. He did not come out from a very ideal family. His mother was struggling with another woman who is part of his father's wife, concubine. And yet the mother of Samuel brought him up to serve the Lord, to follow the Lord. So when Samuel was still very young, he introduced him to the ministry in the tabernacle. Probably for cleanup, probably to become the assistant of the priest. And while he was there, the Lord had given him the responsibility to bring the message of judgment to the family of Eli, the priest. And these are the words of God concerning against Eli. 1 Samuel chapter 2, look at verse 27. And there came a man of God unto Eli and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Did I plainly appear unto the house of thy father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? And did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest? To offer upon mine altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me. And did I give unto the house of thy father all the offerings made by fire of the children of Israel? Wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice 
and mine offering, which I have commanded in my habitation. And honorest thy sons above me, to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. Wherefore the Lord God of Israel said, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord said, Be it far from me, for them that honor me I will honor, and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. What is the accusation of God upon this family? Eli, you are the priest. Your sons are not living the lives that they have to live as your assistants, as your co-workers in this tabernacle. You know that they're living in sin, and yet you still allow them to continue to serve. You honor them more than you honor me. Now God is taking the offense. I was talking to one of these pastor's kid. Now the Lord have graciously restored him. But this was his lament for many years. Many years back, he said, I would never set my foot again in Don Baptist Church. Yes, I know I failed. My father barred me. You know, sometimes we pastor's kids, we have this feeling. And sometimes we resent because of this feeling. We have this feeling that our fathers would rather lose us than his ministry. Now, let me illustrate. You know, sometimes when we do some foolish things, our fathers would straighten us up and always would tell us, you are the one that's going to pit to put me out in the ministry. If you're not going to follow me, I would rather leave you this house rather than put the ministry at stake. Now for us, we get hurt. We don't understand why our fathers would rather give us up rather than the ministry. Now later on we realize our fathers just don't want to follow what had happened in the life of Eli. I hope one day I could invite him. He really wanted to come and to give his testimony that the Lord had given his father a pastor all these years to see him come back again to God. But of course, his father had this testimony. I know it's hard for me to let go of my son, but I would rather let go of my son than let go of my God. At the end, the son is restored unto God. The very same person who is telling us the story of Eli, later on would also tell his own story. Continuing on on his book in 1 Samuel chapter 7, Look at verse 15. And Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. And he went from year to year in circuit to Bethel, Gilgal, Mespi, and judged Israel in all those places. And his return was to Ramah, for there was his house. And he judged Israel, and there he built an altar unto the Lord. Look at chapter 8. And it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second is Abiah. They were judges in Beersheba. And his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre or money, and took bribes and perverted judgment. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel and to Ramah, and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel. The very thing that have started monarchy before this, it's really God is the one ruling. Theocracy, God is their king. But really, the thing that have triggered of them calling about having a king is because his sons 
that he wanted to help him. His sons accepted money, bribes. Now those people have studied this, commentator would tell us that really Samuel lived a kind of life that he was so busy with his ministry to the whole nation of Israel. And the, and the places mentioned, they were far apart. In other words, from one place to another place to another place, he would go around the nation of Israel. But then in those places, he did not even put up his own house there. Because his house is in Rama. It's still another city, a far off from those cities that he would go around. Now, Bible commentators would tell us that Samuel was so busy doing the ministry, he failed to be a blessing to his own family. Nobody could ever reason out with God and say, God, I am so busy with my work. I have no time to disciple, to have family altar with my own family. The very same writer who have seen what the judgment of God on the family of Eli was not able to prevent something that would happen to his own family. Now, while we were still students in Don Baptist Seminary, I have some classmates and schoolmates who have looked into the families of our faculty members and some pastors. And probably during those times, we were so idealistic that sometimes we kind of magnify the kapalpakan kag mga tinarso sa mga kabataan sa pastor. Not realizing that when we point our finger to those pastor's sons and daughters who are not living for the Lord, we didn't realize that we're also pointing three fingers to us. So one of my schoolmates, in the past few months, we started to talk and he said, I don't know if I'll ever stay in the ministry. I said, what happened? My son rebelled against the Lord. Remember while we were still students? We looked down on those faculty or pastors that we realized that their children were rebelling. They were not living for the Lord. And now it's happening in my family. Why should I ever pursue the ministry? Because the very thing that I hated when I was still a student, now it's happening in my family. Now we realize that it's one thing to point our fingers to others. It's another thing when it's already happening in our family. But you know, when this happened to our family, the Lord is just teaching us humility. It's not about because we're better than other Christians or workers or pastors, but it's only because of the grace of God that we could hold on, we could hang on to stay there for the Lord. So here we find Samuel. Yes, he was busy. The Lord anointed him. Everybody knew that the unction of the Lord is upon him, and yet he failed to be a blessing to his own family. May this family, our family, would never follow that kind of way that we are already too busy, whatever justification we have. I'm too busy with my work. I'm too busy with my ministry. I'm too busy. Yes, again, I'm going to repeat it. That our greatest challenge and our most precious mission field is still our young people. We will never be busy to disciple them, to win them to the Lord, to do many things for them because in the judgment day, it's not about how many countries we have reached for Christ. But really, it's about what did we do with the young people that the Lord has given upon us. And this would bring us now to the last example that I want us to consider. His name is Abraham. In Genesis chapter 18, God is going to punish the, the, uh, the two cities, Sodom and Gomorrah. So God visited Abraham wanting him to know of his plan of Sodom and Gomorrah, realizing that indeed in Sodom and Gomorrah, his nephew Lot was there. 
Look at verses 17 to 19 on, verse eight, on uh, chapter 18. The word of God would tell us on verse 17, And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham the thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he had spoken of him. Looking at what is happening in the nation of Israel today, we realize that this one man have influenced his family, not only his immediate family, but in many, many, many generations. The Lord blessed Israel because of this one man. But then, you have your part. God has his part in keeping the promise and in fulfilling how he's going to do about in bringing the blessing, but also we have our part. Let me illustrate. In the past few days, we had been dealing with planning on the next half of this year. So we wanted to know how much we spend on our evangelism and our discipleship. But then I have to remind our pastoral staff that there are some things that God would do and God should do and only God could do. And there are also things that we should do. It's not right that in our evangelism, we would say that in the past six months, there are 100 people who got saved. Salvation is of the Lord. That's not our part. Saving people, that is God's part. Our part is sharing the Word of God. So really, I was more concerned on the opportunities that we are doing. Now later on in our, in our, in our, uh, in our uh, business meeting, we would show you figures. But roughly right now, I want to tell you, and I'm so thrilled about this, if there are 2,000 people who gather here in our auditorium every Sunday in our four services, I am so thrilled to know that in our Bible studies, in our talk council renderings ministries, in our police, in our mall evangelism, every single week we are reaching about 1,000 people. That's our part. Now, are we going to say at the end of six months that you would say, oh, there are 100 souls saved. Praise God, 100. Who would say 100? That is God's part. If he could save 100, praise God. If he would save the whole thousand, praise God. But our part is how much we put in in our evangelism. How many people we want to reach for Christ. I'm so thrilled when I was listening to every single one, the opportunities that we have to share the gospel. To about a thousand people every week. So I want to say that it is unfair that if you're a father or, if, or you are the parents and if your son turned their backs from God, it is unfair to say you failed. I don't know if you could remember in your experience if you know of a pastor that his son or daughter right now is not living for God. I hope nobody of us would point our finger and would say, Pastor, you failed. Why? The saving, that is God's part. I planted, Apostle Paul said, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Spiritual growth is of God. But the question is, did we do our best to disciple others? Will you as a father, will you as a mother, will you as a spiritual parent, could you honestly say before God, God, you know my heart. You know everything I did for this generation. You know that. But God, in saving them, in making them grow, Thank you, Lord. It's your work. I'm waiting on you.
One time in our prayer fellowship, we were invited by one of those who are still new to our, to our prayer fellowship. He said, would you let us sponsor our prayer fellowship the next month? So the day came, and when we reached the house, it was just like a fiesta. Probably longer than this table, filled with food. So I asked secretly for those who were there, I said, are we celebrating some birthday? Are we celebrating? But anyway, after we started our, uh, our uh, testimony time, our praising to God, our host gave her testimony. He said, I'm having this celebration because if my father is still alive today, he would be so thrilled to see me coming back to God. And then she gave her testimony. She said, I was still a young person, even in high school. I rebelled against my Christian father. I rebelled to the point that I really wanted to hurt him. So I married an unbeliever. I was still in high school. And I think he carried it in his heart until he died. But today, Bible study came to my house. How I wish my father is here to see me again come back to God. This, this is what I'm trying to tell you. The putting of the seed, the telling, repeating the word of God over and over again until that seed later on will just sprung up. And the next generation would realize, thank you, Papa. Thank you, Mama. How I wish that you're here to witness what God is doing in my heart. But it was your planting. It was you watering. But I know it's God who is really convincing me now to come back to Him. I want to tell you this morning, God has placed these spiritual leaders in our lives to make us see that we have a Heavenly Father who have placed these leaders in our homes, in our church. And one day, God, through their ministry, will make us grow stronger, will make us come back to God, will make our hearts soften for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, bless your word upon our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for the ministry of your word. And Lord, for about 30 minutes, 45 minutes every Sunday, this will not do the job. But Lord, we have fathers, we have mothers, we have spiritual parents, day in and day out, who have reminded us your word, your statutes, your command, that probably, Lord, we are not even mindful or even to the point at times hardening our hearts, rebelling against. And yet, Lord, the Holy Spirit used your word to challenge us, to make us realize, to make us long for you. Until, Lord, you bring out that would only deserve your honor and glory, the miracle that our parents, our fathers, wanted to see in our lives. Bless your word upon our hearts. Encourage us, O Lord. Challenge us. And even, Lord, at this moment, we commit to you the fathers, the disciples, the spiritual parents, that as we do the job, your Holy Spirit would use your word to challenge, to convict, and may indeed your honor and glory alone will be seen in all this. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.